Harold, can you tell us what the Senior Vice President of External Affairs at the Metropolitan Museum of Art uh, does? In the Lincoln Bicentennial year or, or usually? Uh, both. <laughs> well, it's been a little tough this year because of the Lincoln focus and the museum has been very, very um, understanding and encouraging of my uh, uh, fulfilling my obligations to the Bicentennial Commission and to my books this year. But external affairs at the Met embraces um, public relations, marketing, uh, internal communications, uh, multicultural audience development, um, advertising, uh, and uh, the visitor services group at the Met, which uh, it's about 150 people who not only welcome visitors to the museum but uh, and man the information and uh, and admissions desks, but also do uh, surveys and do tourism marketing as well. Now most Hold of your just one second. Sorry to interrupt. Mark, can you take that lamp and just slide it towards the door? Like this a, one? Yeah. No, the other one. You getting a bounce? No, it's just kind of like right behind your head. Okay. So it doesn't. I'm mean, gonna actually put powder on a this one. more that way. I know my. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Do we That's have to good. do that again? No. Okay. You'll only be wearing. That. Lampshade. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Now, most of the time, how, how many years at the Met have, have you been there? Uh, Sixteen. And and that, for almost all that tenure, it was under Philippe Montebello. Yes. Correct. Yes. Was he was encouraging on on your Lincoln uh, research and uh, sp specifically your interest in Lincoln iconography? Yes. I think when I first um, went for the job. Um, he was, well, I would say he was tolerant in the beginning. <laughs> my great piece of good fortune was that my, my major interview was conducted by the then president of the Met, William Lures, who is a, a Springfield resident, mm -hmm. one of these extremely tall people that Springfield seems to produce. He's about 6'6", former ambassador to, uh, to uh, Czechoslovakia. And when we conducted the interview, he said, um, I see that you're a Lincoln scholar. You know, I grew up in Springfield, Illinois. And I said to him, are you related to the Lures Shoe Company that sold shoes uh, allegedly to the Lincoln children? And he said, I can't believe you know that. That's when I actually knew I would be hired. It's that epiphany that comes with the Lincoln Association. The shoe store still exists, and they have the framed bill of sales. Wow. Um, and so it is the same family. It is the same family. And he grew up with um, um, people that we knew in the old days with um, 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 Bunch Bun and... and, and um, and knew Sally Schonbacher and all the old guard at the ALA, and uh, so we knew this. Basically, he knew John Chapin. He knew all the, the uh, the the original for me the original uh, leaders of the Lincoln community in Springfield. So it was a very nice reunion, and uh, he was encouraging his successor as president, Emily Rafferty, is encouraging. So yeah, it's a wonderful atmosphere, and they respect intellectual pursuits as long as you do your job. And, but you also mine some of the collections there for shows. We do. It's, it, we don't have very much, I must say. Um, we have some sculpture material. We recently bought Augustus St. Gaudens' uh, own copy of a very early bronze casting of the Volk uh, hand of Lincoln, the left hand, which of course was cast just down the block from where we're speaking at the Presidential Library at Lincoln's home. Um, a day after uh, his nomination to the presidency. Um, the right hand of St. Gordon's collection was sold across the park to the New York Historical Society. So the Twains have to meet at some point, and we're having, the Met is having a St. Gordon's exhibition okay. in the spring of, of 2009, at which we will have some of his Lincoln models as well. So that'll be our little bicentennial contribution. We still need a Lincoln painting at the Met. And um, we have on permanent loan right now um, one of uh, the paintings uh, made during the campaign um, by um, Johnston, by Thomas Johnston of Boston. It's the one that used to be called the Long Lost Life Portrait, but in fact it was based on a C.S. German photograph. And yet it was made, you know, it's by an artist who was here in Springfield in that June period in 1860 when all the painters came into town. So it's hanging in my office right now on permanent loan. When the, ex when the American wing of the Met reopens, it's going to go to the American wing, and hopefully the owner uh, will eventually allow it to pass into the Met collection. And you're also kind of the guest curator for a show that will be at New York Historical, correct? Yes. Also through the sufferance of the Met, I might, I might, <laughs> um, I might add. I'm the guest historian. That's the, 
the uh, precise word um, okay. so I don't get confused with the professional staff and the academic staff at the Met. Yeah, it's an interesting show. It's going to, um, uh, it's called Lincoln and New York. It's opening in October um, 09 and it's going to detail New York's influence on Lincoln and Lincoln's influence on New York. And it's a good story because um, I've told the story before, uh, certainly about the Cooper Union speech and photograph, uh, but uh, moving along in this remarkable place where he only got 28 or 29 percent of the vote in 1860 and not much more in 1864, it was not only the commercial culture that produced the Lincoln we know, it was the anti-Lincoln tradition was really seething through New York, racist um, a criticism of Lincoln. It's the place where Lincoln shut down newspapers. Uh, one of the places. It's the it's the uh, the location of the draft riots, the most uh, the biggest race riot in American history, and also the worst civil disturbance. Some calculate aside from the Civil War itself in American history. So, and amidst all this, he's being promoted uh, as an image sold to the benefit of uh, of uh, printmakers like Currier and Ives who are flourishing in New York. And with all the anti-war opposition, New York is also the place where the Parrot guns are. Uh, improved rifled cannon is created uh, up the river a little bit and right across the East River um, the monitor is built in Greenpoint Brooklyn in the Navy Yards there. Are you going to deal at all with any of Mary's shopping sprees and uh, identify some of the stores? We are. Uh, Mary was a great patron of they can really use her now because New York <laughs> retail is in trouble uh, as we speak at Lincoln's 200th and uh, she was a very good patron of A.T. Stewart's and we are, we have, um, uh, Catherine Clinton has written a chapter for the catalog and, um, and it's about Mary and the, the commercial culture of New York and she's got some wonderful new stuff that uh, probably uh, it will also appear in her Mary biography that's just out but uh, we'll, um, uh, with wonderful illustrations of, of the way the stores looked. And some of the buildings are still there, not many, some. Now, I think you've said in previous interviews, you know, the, the Lincoln bug bit you early in life. And uh, can you just talk a little bit about that? You know, what, what was that kind of seminal moment and, um, and how that's evolved? Yeah, it was an accident, I guess. I was in a fifth grade class in New York City in a public school, and our teacher, um, and it, you know, it, it sometimes, so often it comes down to a really inventive, inspiring teacher. Mm -hmm. She decided one day to bring in the names of famous people, folded on little slips of paper, and put them in her hat, and shook them up and asked us to pick a name and write a two page composition about the person. What the idea was, it, we were an experimental elementary school in a junior high school, the equivalent of a middle school today, I guess. And it had a decent library. And what she wanted us to do is use our library period to go upstairs and read on a specific subject, which is a good way to teach research to a 12-year-old, 11-year-old, whatever I was. So I picked Lincoln out of the hat. And um, my best friend, Dennis, picked Genghis Khan. And he became a rock and roll promoter. So these things can be very insidiously powerful and influential. I went upstairs and looked in the Lincoln section and was attracted to this jet black book edge binding, whatever you, uh, f um, I can't remember what you call it. And I should because spine. the spine, of course. Um, and um, it was Richard Nelson Currents, The Lincoln Nobody Knows. And it was just, and, I, and when I pulled it out of the shelf, it was even more beautiful with that vivid broken glass photograph of Lincoln on the cover. And I was just in, in, enraptured even at that age. And, and then it, the evolution, it moved on to Stephen Laurent's books on Lincoln photographs. Um, I don't often give him enough credit. He was very influential on me because of the archival nature and the detective nature of his searches for, for Lincoln photographs. And when I read the story of the young boy who we now know as the uh, Lincoln scholar Ronald Rietveld who found a Lincoln photograph. I thought this was my destiny. I will find an original photograph, maybe not Lincoln in his coffin the way Rietveld did, but something spectacular. Launching a 40 year search that has not produced an original photograph but has been fun. And Laurent was not only um, 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 an inspiration through his books, 
but he was very nice to me uh, because I started corresponding with Lincoln people when I was in my teens. Mm -hmm. I corresponded with Laurent, with Josephine Cobb at the National Archives, with James Hickey here at the then Illinois State Historical Society, with um, Ruth Painter Randall. I still have all their postcards and letters. So, and, and most of them were very, very nice and encouraging and tolerant, which I try to do today. I, and it's easier today because email gives you an opportunity to dash off these things in, in, a, in a second. Um, but I, 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 do th I learned from that, at le one thing I learned, in addition to the Lincoln things I learned, was that um, to be encouraging and to answer questions, and uh, mm -hmm. I know you've done that for years and years as part of your job, but it's, it's a nice feeling to get a letter back, thanks for taking the time. The, uh, when did you start doing your, those regular columns for, what was the trade? Oh, the, an trade? the, the antique trader. Yeah. You know, I was looking, f in my 20s, looking for a way to write. And when I was about 20 or 21, I fell under the thrall of a photographer and photo historian named Leo Staschen, who died about 25 years ago. But he was convinced that he had found, and you and I have seen these over the years, an original unknown daguerreotype of Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> that his daguerreotype looked nothing like Lincoln. I always thought it was Thomas Hart Benton in later years. I think it, I mean, it's a grand full plate daguerreotype that must have been very expensive to make. And it's one of these, it's gotta be somebody. And when I think of the, the daguerreotypes that he traded away to get portraits as he became more and more convinced that he saw famous people. Uh, anyway, we, when, when I was first married, um, we used to go away weekends to, um, to uh, Pennsylvania Dutch country. And he would look for daguerreotypes and my wife and I would basically furnish our first apartment buying antiques and started to buy Lincoln things at, at uh, antique shows and, uh, and flea markets. And at the Ephrata Cal Cocalico Valley Historical Society Fair, they sold the contents of their historical society. And there sitting on the edge of a table, lying on the ground was the National Republican chart of H. H. Lloyd, the, the chart that we think Grace Bedell saw, of which there are only about five or six left in the world, and um, um, we bid on it, and the bidding was going dollar by dollar by dollar, 74, 75, 79, and um, just the experience of going there made me think of proposing this. I used to write an annual Lincoln feature. I think that came first for this big collector's paper that's published in Dubuque, and then they asked me to do a column, and eventually I found a way to turn to more scholarly pursuits, but that was also fun. Lots of mail and uh, responses, and I had a team of experts to help me with what I didn't know, which was almost everything I was writing about except Lincoln, so it was fun. Now, you've had just really very interesting careers. I mean, you were in public television, mm -hmm. and then you got involved in politics. You worked on Bella Abzug's campaign. And right, Bella all. was first. Bella okay. was first. I had worked for a weekly newspaper and been supportive of her in my columns. So she came to me in 1975 and told me she was going to run for the United States Senate. And would I be her press secretary? I had no idea what a press secretary did, except for talking to press secretaries as a reporter. But um, I spent uh, two and a half to three official years with her and you know, basically 20 years doing what she asked of me. Because she was sort of my graduate school. I didn't go to graduate school. She was my graduate school in government and in public relations. She was not easy. She was pr today you'd probably report her to the Human Resources Department on the first day <laughs> and sue. But uh, boy, was she smart and was she, I mean, she knew everybody's job better than they did. And uh, if you could endure the browbeating, um, you could learn a lot, and I did. Did you ever get one of her hats? I do, I have one of her hat and hats, and it's signed by her in the brim. It sits in my den, along with my, it's the only non-Lincoln thing in my den. Well, I, I bring this up because the one thing I, I noticed in your work that was, was really insightful is that it seemed that you brought your practical experience from both the Abzug and from Cuomo, and you were able to see things in the Lincoln story that traditional historians had, had just overlooked. You'd be able to make these connections. Is, is that a, a misreading of? No, I, I'm, I'm glad you read it that way. I, I think the hands-on experience in politics makes me a little bit unique in the, in the, in the Lincoln world. I think every, there are a lot of Lincoln people who are very 
committed to politics and volunteer, but it's a little different to be on the inside and to consider public relations strategy. And you know, Lincoln was very helpful in this regard. He gives us a clue when he says public sentiment is everything. People who affect public opinion are more important than people who make statutes. I think that's the quote. He was uncanny in the pre-marketing era, certainly where it was considered uncouth for a politician to care about his own image. He mastered this brilliant method of both um, detracting himself, you know, being uh, talking about his homeliness and joking about his appearance and making sure that flattering and politically helpful renditions were created, manufactured, promulgated, all while being a, a sort of an aw shucks subject. Brilliant, because we have the reputation of him as, and, and I think most people hold dear the idea that he was very modest, and yet he practically had court artists by the time he got to the White House, sculptors, life masks, photographs. He, was, he figured it out that in his suffering face people would find sustenance or at least understanding of his uh, sometimes very tough uh, policies. All of the, the early books, you know, focus on iconography yes. and the development of this image. And I, I, the other thing that, that I've really appreciated is showing kind of the um, cross-pollinization, you know, what artists were doing and then what lithographers would, would pick up and, mm -hmm. and, and do. And can you talk a little bit more about, about that? This sure. You know, it, as much as I, I respected Stefan Laurent and, and appreciated his interest in me, and Lloyd Ostendorf later was, mm -hmm. was a good mentor and friend, um, I originally, like many other people, saw photographs in a vacuum. They were recordings of Lincoln's face and form over a period uh, from 1846 to 1865. And they were meant to be uh, listed chronologically, and the sittings that produced them were meant to be investigated, the date, the eyewitnesses, and that was about it. But in fact, there was always a reason for these encounters. And uh, Lincoln, uh, again, practicing the role of a Victorian modest person, always permitted himself to be ushered or importuned into photo galleries. Um, why was that? Well, that's what creates this idea of cross-pollinization. He's usually, uh, many photographs are made because artists can't quite get him to sit still for sittings, the way George Washington so patiently endured mm -hmm. Gilbert Stewart's um, requirement that he sit still, because that was the only way to do it in those days. Um, and Washington would sit for, stand for two hours for Stewart at a time. Uh, Lincoln didn't do that. So that's why we have this rich archive of campaign photographs in 1860. Almost all of them made here in Springfield were made at the request of artists. Alexander Hessler's campaign portraits were really um, the, the required by Thomas Hicks, who did the first painting. Um, the, one of the great uh, C.S. German photographs of Lincoln with the beard uh, in, ja in uh, January of 1861 was made at the request of a sculptor, Thomas D. Jones. The fabulous Preston Butler ambrotype of Lincoln with a lock of hair falling over his forehead with his arms folded like this was made at the request of an artist, um, um, John Henry Brown. They couldn't quite get him. And, and even the great photographic sittings in Washington the greatest of the, all the photographic sittings, February 9th, 1864, produces the profile for the copper penny, the model for the profile. It produces the two models that have been used over the years for the $5 bill. Um, it produces the iconic photograph of Lincoln looking at a big book with his son, Tad. It's been adapted as a symbol of reading to children, even though it's a, it's a prop album. Um, and it's just, it's a dazzling sitting for which Lincoln inexplicably wore his hair parted on the wrong side that day, and he looked pretty good. He should have kept it that way. Um, why was it done? It was done at the request of artist Francis Carpenter, who was making his later famous painting of the first reading of the Emancipation Proclamation, was forever looking for photo models. And then, as you say, there's a third generation to all of this. The photo begets the painting. The painting begets lithograph copies, but then the photographs are mass produced. So it's sort of 3.5 generations of renewal and uh, uh, distribution. So all of these disciplines, I thought, deserve to be described as being interconnected and um, all contributing uh, together to the promulgation of Lincoln's image. And how did this really affect the, the broader audience? I mean, how was it received by the general public? 
It's always been hard to, um, to make statistical observations because um, for some reason there are, and I still, that, that's one discovery I'd love to make, for some reason the business records of the America's printmakers are just nowhere to be found. Uh, none of the New York printmakers left any, there, there's a, a little bit from Courier and Ives in the Museum of the City of New York, but nothing that attests to distribution. There are only two ways to, to judge the popularity of prints. And that is their in the endurance of titles in successions of catalogs and advertisements, and the very um, subjective analysis of how many survive and how many we know are out there. We know that Curry and Ives prints proliferated because so many lived. Um, we know when we see one we've never seen before, we can make a fairly good guess um, that they were very, very rare. There is one print. Um, of Lincoln writing the Emancipation Proclamation based on an expressionistic painting by uh, David Gilmore Blythe, a German-born painter, uh, that showed Lincoln with carpet slippers and his foot resting on the Bible and uh, wearing a nightshirt uh, to, to remind people that he was from the prairie and from earth. And uh, a Cincinnati lithographer called Ergot Forbiger printed it as a beautiful lithograph, actually improving it a little bit and making it a little more realistic, but with, still with all the props. Buchanan strung by the neck from a bookcase, things like that. And I only know of a few that exist. So what does that mean? It meant that people looked at this and said, what is he talking about? And so you know, you assume that he wiped the stone clean and did something else with it, or maybe tossed out the unsold prints because they were hand colored, they're gorgeous. I don't know if your collection has one. Yeah, I only know of uh, a few that do. Very few. Do you have a favorite photographic image? That's a tough one. I have to say, it sounds self-serving, but I've come to love the Cooper Union photograph. Because, I mean, after all, <laughs> it's the only photograph of Lincoln that was made in New York. But it's, it's not the sharpest image ever made. Look at those Hessler images made in imperfect uh, circumstances in the state capitol on June, I think it was June 3rd, 1860. That profile and that uh, the full face photographs, they're brilliant. I don't know how he lighted them that way. He must have just had the sun through that big window in the right, at the right moment, at the right time. Uncanny. Um, I love those too, by the way. But the Cooper Union, I think Brady intentionally fuzzed up the focus a little bit because his notion was pull back from this face because I, you know, Brady was, was legally blind, interestingly enough. But he took one look at Lincoln, probably got really close to him with those big thick specs mm -hmm. of his and said, I don't want to be this close, I'm going to back up. Mm -hmm. And he backed up and the, it was the first image of Lincoln that was sort of from the knees up. And he was wearing his new um, suit from uh, well, one of the printmaker, uh, one of the uh, clothing people here, was it Hinkle, from the, uh, the clothier in Springfield? Maybe he'd slept on it in it in the train, but it was still a good looking suit and it was big. And it made him look impressive and prepossessing. And be, maybe because his hands were, I mean, he did have very long arms, did Lincoln, but maybe they didn't reach the table, so they piled up these books so Lincoln could rest his hand on the table and hold his hand still for the exposure. And you know, in those days when you put your hands on books, you were communicating the sense of learning. Brady moved a, he had a, a series of faux, probably plaster of Paris pillars that he, he used when his um, political and diplomatic celebrities came into the studio. So he put a nice pillar behind Lincoln and that indicated statecraft. So it created a whole new Lincoln. This wasn't the rugged guy with a bad collar and a tie askew or wearing Samuel Alshuler's coat with a velvet trim or a white, uh, the white coat he wears at, uh, at, uh, for the, on the Duff Armstrong trial day. This is, a, a, a man who is capable of being a national leader. And I think you can see just from the number of reproductions it inspired in the picture press, uh, in ferrotypes, in buttons, and um, prints, that it was enormously, enormously influential. And Lincoln said, Brady and the Cooper Union speech made me president. So at least that's what Brady remembered. So I'll take him at his word. You're probably one of the most honored scholars active in the Lincoln field. You've been given numerous awards, won a Lincoln Prize. Um, you're now getting the Order of Lincoln. Uh, and I'm wondering, 
how you feel about that, and, and moreover, as co-chair of the Federal Commission, kind of the charge you've been given to go out and talk about the meaning of commemoration and why specifically Lincoln? Well, it's a little tough in one breath to talk about <laughs> my honors and Lincoln's honors, but no, I, 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 I it's really been wonderful, and, and um, um, I, I feel very fortunate, and um, my new book has won a few awards this year in New York, and uh, I got the National Humanities Medal from President Bush in his last couple of months of his presidency, which was bittersweet in a funny way. I mean, it was sort of a depressing atmosphere in the White House. Um, but I did get to meet Olivia de Havilland. She was getting an award. That was fun. A little Civil War connection. The last living the cast member of Stan Lee. It's <laughs> the last uh, Stan Lee, right? He was there too. But she is the last Gone with the Wind yes. survivor, yeah. and she's sharp as a tack. That was nice. Um, um, and the Order of Lincoln is like some mysterious, wonderful thing that I've been hearing about for years, and so <laughs> I can't wait. This is, when this happens, this is going to be the first time that I wear white tie and tails since my wedding, 38, almost 38 years ago. So it's not the same white tie and tails, but uh, it's gonna be interesting. The Lincoln, um, it's been very challenging eight years, I must say, because um, it's always almost been a hurry up and wait for eight years. This commission has existed since 2001, it was really, created in the Clinton administration. So we've been through three administrations. But aside from the creation of the website and the um, creation of school curricula and the work with the Mint and the Postal Service to create the new pennies and stamps, it has been a buildup to a moment that is upon us as we speak and uh, that is being, you know, it's, it, and I spoke about this on, on tele another television experience a few, a few days ago. It's almost a very welcome, um, irony to Lincoln's nationalism that this has been most um, excitingly a, 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 a bicentennial that has been created by many states. States are doing fantastic jobs. I can't say New York has. We've had our three governors in the last two years has not been helpful. We really have done very little sadly although we hope our New York exhibition uh, but Illinois I mean in very all of us facing very difficult budget times, but the the new signage events in Illinois and all of the excitement that I've been reading about for the last few weeks in every part of Lincoln's Illinois, from Mount Pulaski to Springfield, and um, is 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 exciting. And, and states in the South, Louisiana, Virginia, amazing contributions. Everything linked electronically now, and of course there will be a lot of excitement on February 12th all over the country. Um, with uh, President Obama coming to, to Springfield um, after going to Florida and Indiana, I know here. So it's gonna be an interest. I just heard the itinerary has been released today. So he's gonna be actually making a, uh, a sweep of uh, support for legislation and come Springfield from the, we thought he would go from Washington, but apparently that's not the case. And, and in Chicago on Valentine's Day. Chicago on Valentine's Day. I think he's, he's getting tired of the White House more quickly than most presidents. <laughs> one more, if, if I may, one sure. more thing about President Obama. This has been the difference between a, one, a very interesting and meaningful bicentennial and a national celebration of immense proportions. His interest in Abraham Lincoln as expressed in his announcement um, a few blocks from here at the old state capitol. Um, even in the days when many of us, especially those of us in New York, didn't think he was going to be president. But his relentless devotion to, to, to Lincoln, um, his sighting of Lincoln uh, and Grand Park at his victory speech, his references to Lincoln in uh, Constitution Hall and his his, um, I think what will be remembered as a landmark moment, his speech on, on race relations in this country. His decision to recreate the inaugural journey to take his oath, at least the first time, on the Bible that Lincoln held. I don't know if you ever held that Bible. It's a little tiny thing. I just imagine Lincoln's immense hands. Of he didn't rest his hand on the Bible. He must have overwhelmed it. It's just lifted this boat, this boat that we had that was doing fine, but it's the tide has lifted all of Link, the Lincoln world, and everyone is interested and watching. And so it's just a you know 
I don't know how I'm going to feel on February 13th. Like a lot of air has been let out of the balloon, but uh, it's exciting to blow it's, it up. It's good to end on a high note, though. It's, yeah, and I think, you know, I think we have a very good chance, um, because of the accident of the calendar, to sustain this at a very high level for years to come. Uh, even as our various commissions fade uh, into history and we make our final reports, um, Cooper Union is having its 150th anniversary in the fall of 09. The Civil War sesquicentennial starts in 01, and while there isn't and probably won't be a national commission because of you know, cutbacks and, and, and budgetary concerns, there is already building an enormous interest. So w we will, I think we'll be mining the Lincoln story um, at the high levels for another uh, six or seven or eight years. And then we can slip into retirement and be happy with ourselves. <laughs> Harold, thanks so much. Thank you, Tom. Thanks.